Hello and welcome to the 21st evening of the Festival of Europe. For today's travels, we will discover the wonders of Italy. My name is Ben Green, and I'll be your moderator for our journey with Rick and David. And now, along with more than 3,000 households who are already with us tonight, I would like to introduce and welcome our tour guide, Rick Steves. Buonasera, Rick. Uh, Buonasera, Ben, and thank you for the introduction. And uh, boy, I want to thank our Monday night travel team. As you mentioned, this is what, night number 20 or 21 or something like that. We have had a great three weeks and uh, tomorrow is our big party, our grand finale. Uh, so just thanks for joining us. I'm really excited about tonight. We wanted to finish things off here of our, of our regular series of country specific evenings with another look at Italy and without a specific um, uh, geographic focus, but just to celebrate Italian lifestyles and Italian culture, because that's what you experience on any of our tours to Italy. So uh, I want to just um, get you right into this. I want to remind you that uh, we're here for about an hour or an hour and 10 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A. And if you have any questions, you can see the Q&A widget there. Be sure to ask them. And Ben and Julianne and Heidi and Stephen will be working behind the scenes to make sure that we answer as many of your questions as we can. And right now, I'd love to just get into this program. Once again, this is our, every year we're just accustomed to having an alumni party. We take tens of thousands of people on our tours every year. And for 20 years or more, we've invited uh, the alums to come to Seattle or a little town north of Seattle and have a party. And we have six parties in a row, a couple thousand people converge in our little town. And it's a messing of the scrapbooks, all of these new memories, getting together with old friends from the road. And we fly our guides in from all over Europe. And while the guides are in town, they give a series of talks called Test Drive a Tour Guide. And that's what we've been doing for the last three weeks, every night, Test Drive a Tour Guide, inviting guides to join us from every corner of Europe as we dream about our next European travels. Of course, during this festival, we're selling tours and we sure are excited about how many people have been signing up on our tours. But I wanna stress that this festival is also for people who are just gonna go over there and grab a good guidebook and, and, and be their own tour guides. That's my main thing is to write all these guidebooks so that people can do our tours without us. That's what a Rick Steves guidebook is designed to enable you to do. So we've got guidebooks covering every corner of Europe and that the uh, Italy is well covered with lots of books. We just love uh, trying to make sure we sort through all the options that Italy has to offer. And uh, just, I just love it when I see people ripping out the chapters and having the time of their life in Italy on their own or with a tour guide. The main thing we don't want is boring travel. A lot of people scrimp and save and they finally get over to Europe and it's just not what they thought it would be. You deserve the best trip. You deserve the trip of a lifetime. And if we can have anything to do with it, whether you take a tour or just use our guidebooks, we'd love to help you out. I just love and sort of a, a, a youthful, fun-loving approach to Europe. We can all be just like kids romping through Europe. But what we have is the comfort and safety and convenience and efficiency of a big bus. This is a typical bus load right here as we go through Europe. We have 40 different itineraries about 150 guides, most of them Europeans, and we are together right now celebrating this program of ours. As you can see here, we are on the second to the last day of the festival. I do wanna remind you, every single one of these events is now recorded and saved and cataloged. It will be there from now on out at ricksteves.com. You can just burrow into our website, and if you look in the travel festival section, you can watch any of the classes you may have missed. We're going to be talking about Italy tonight, but there's two other classes of Italy, uh, Sunday, January 15th and Tuesday, January 10th. And that would be a couple more hours of Italian information. As I mentioned, we have 40 different itineraries. And in Italy, we have a lot of itineraries. We've got the best of Italy in 17 days. I uh, just love that itinerary, that route. Uh, we've got the heart of Italy, which is sort of the best we could do in nine days for variety. Rome, the hill towns, the Riviera and Florence. Uh, we've got the best of South Italy in 13 days. Great for somebody who has seen Italy as far south as Rome and they want more. 
uh, we've got My Way Italy, which is about a thousand dollars cheaper than the other tours for that much time. And My Way Italy gives you the bones of the tour, the hotels, the bus connection, and a guide that goes along just to make sure you're going to be situated okay and you do your own touring with the guidebook. And that's something that works well for a lot of our travelers. Uh, we've got the best of Sicily. In fact, we dedicated a whole evening to Sicily on our schedule that you could watch if you'd like to. And our best selling tour, I believe, of all 40 itineraries that we offer is Venice, Florence and Rome in 10 days. I can't think of a more exciting 10 days in Europe, especially if you love art and if you love Italy. Three nights each, Venice, Florence and Rome. Uh, Village Italy, I took my family on this tour a few years ago, or a lot of years ago, and I love it because there's no famous stops. It is village, it is intimate, it is offbeat, it is rural, it is artisan, and it's beautiful food. Uh, that's a very popular tour, especially if you've done all the must-see things in Italy, and then you really want to get more intimate with the Italian culture. A brand new tour of ours that's just a year or two old is our Best of Tuscany tour, and it's already a hit. Uh, people are just raving about that itinerary. And um, I also want to remind you, if you're an independent traveler, you can grab any of these tours uh, routes and do it on your own. I love it when people use our routes and then they equip themselves with a guidebook and they just do it on their own terms at their own temple. Um, we're going to be giving away two more tours tomorrow night. So if you put your name in the virtual basket, we're going to pull two names out tomorrow. And that will be four tours we've given away. All the details are on the website. If you go to ricksteves.com, look in the tour festival page and right up on the top, it says our tour giveaway contest. And uh, it'll say all the details there. And right there, there's a link you can sign up. It's very easy. It's quick. It's fun. And who knows, you might win a tour to Venice or I'm sorry, Paris, London, Rome or Istanbul. Everybody's a winner when it comes to booking a tour this month. If they use the promo code, $100 off on each seat, and that's good only through January 31st. So if you've been wondering and dreaming and thinking, should we do this? You've got a chance to save a little money if you make that decision by the end of the month. Well, I am so thankful there's a man with good taste in scarves, just like me, that is going to join us right now. And I was just in Italy two months ago and met David Tordi in his hometown of Orvieto. And today, David joins us. I, I believe, David, you're visiting uh, in-laws in Boston. So uh, thanks for interrupting your family time and joining us today. My pleasure. My pleasure, Rick. It's always a pleasure. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ben. Hello, everyone listening and watching. Chin chin. Salute, chin chin. Salute. All right. Well, David, we're having a party here. We're going to be talking about Italy. I just love talking with you in an ad lib kind of way about the wonders and the riches and the, the complexities and the surprises of Italian lifestyle and culture. And yeah, you are a wonderful, you've got an advantage as a guide because you're sort of married into American culture, aren't you? Tell us uh, how you know America so well and where you live in Italy. So, yes, I am married into America because my wife is from Boston, the United States, and this is where I am right now visiting my in-laws. Um, but I've always I've always worked in international fields even before becoming a tour guide. So I always had to uh, work and collaborate with uh, North Americans and English speakers. So and I was I've always been very fascinated about the North American culture. And then family brought me here. And uh, and I, I think. I think I'm still learning. I'm still learning about the American culture, but also I'm learning about the Italian culture, even but, though I, I was born and raised in Italy. So, you know, it's it's interesting, David. As a guide, you need to know who your who your travelers are. You need to know the American culture, and you need, of course, know the culture that you're representing. Uh, in your case, Italy. And uh, I th I think any guide who has uh, a little foot in both cultural camps has a bit of an a, a advantage because you can understand what might be the perspective of the American visitor and the things that are confusing and a little overwhelming and be able to communicate that and sort it out. It must be fun to take your American groups around and turn them on to the wonders of Italy. It's the best job in the world, in my, in my personal opinion. I, I, love, I love to show around my, my own area and culture. And it's great when what I know is actually comes to comes handy, you know, comes uh, at use. Yeah. So. That is a, a, a blessing, isn't it? I, I got a degree in European history just for kicks before I ever knew I would be a tour guide. And <laughs> uh, it actually came in a little handy. So uh, yeah. Here's, yeah. Here's, to, here's to finding your niche. We're lucky people. Si, salute. Salute. 
Hey, before we get any deeper into our glasses, what are you drinking? And I'll, then I'll, uh, I'll show you what I'm drinking. So it's a uh, red from Tuscany. Mm -hmm. It's called Rosso di Montepulciano, mm -hmm. which is not the famous Nobile di Montepulciano, but it's kind of the little underdog of Montepulciano, less famous, but as good. I'm so glad to hear you say that because that's my go-to wine um, when I'm in when I'm in Tuscany for sure. Rosso yeah. di Montepulciano, right? Yes. Very you nice. Know, a guy who knows a guy, and and then I got my wine stock here. So <laughs> I decided I'm going to have a, a aperol spritz because we're going to be talking about Italian yeah. fun culture, and this is such a hit these days, isn't it? What's what's in an aperol spritz? Aperol spritz, technically speaking, it's a mix of three ingredients. Soda water, Prosecco sparkling wine. And if you don't have Prosecco, you can add another sparkling wine. And Aperol liqueur, which is an orange based liqueur you show in the bottle. So they say 33% each ingredient, but then it's your personal taste that, that drives the, the recipe. Oh, baby. Nice. Well, let's get going here. We got a lot of ground to cover. And again, thank you, David, for joining us here. And um, we were just together in Orvieto, and uh, boy, I'll never forget enjoying your band. Uh, you're with a band called Bartender, and you actually uh, brought the boys over when we were here a couple of years ago, and we just had so much fun. You played in a little uh, series of uh, bars and venues around Seattle and around the Northwest, and we had you right here in my house with our guides, and we're going to listen to you play the guitar a little while later, but I do want to remind uh, people that if you want to link to David's band, it's bartender, and that will be in the notes for today's show. David, I want to kick off the um, PowerPoint with this shot. My bare feet on a pavement from Venice. And I was thinking, what are the little intimate moments that help you connect with a culture? And a ritual for me when I get to my, ho my hotel in an old hotel in downtown Venice is to take off my shoes and walk bare feet on the Pavmento di Veneziano. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful speckled kind of, a, I don't know, linoleum is not quite the right word, but it flexes as the buildings settle into the, into the lagoon, the floor can bend with it, can't it? And it's a beautiful bit of Venice. Uh, what do you know about pavement of Venice? Well, this is a unique uh, design invented in Venice. It's a, it's a pavimento, pavimento in Italian means floor. Uh, made by all sorts of beads and cracks and little pieces of broken stones, many colorful stones from all over the place. And then they're put together and then they're, they're kind of glued together with this special stucco. You see the stucco, the brown in yeah. between the stones, it's, that's the special kind of stucco. And, the, and these master makers in Venice, they're incredible craftsmen and women. They use these special rolls and make it very flat and even, and they turn it into a durable and yet flexible because of the stucco, uh, floor, pavement, and that's why it's called Pavimento Veneziano. And this is a little intimate reason why I like to stay in funky, old-fashioned hotels right in the center, because if you're in a, at a Holiday Inn on the mainland, you're not going to have a Pavimento di Veneziano, that's for sure. I like this shot here, because I often like to think one of these people could be a tourist. <laughs> Probably not. But, you know, mm -hmm. the goal is for us to fit into the scene, isn't it? Yeah. That's just a great, a, what would you imagine is going on here? Well, the guy in the back that's staring at the newspaper, uh, he could be a tourist, but he's not. Uh, this is a bunch of people, a bunch of locals uh, in an Italian piazza, in an Italian square, getting together, discussing about everything, food, sports, politics. Mainly, it's only, always these three subjects. Um, food, sports, politics, and actually uh, women for men and men for women. Those are the four subjects. <laughs> the four and, subjects. Um, the it's guy's reading a sports newspaper called Gazzetta dello Sport, which is the pink color newspaper. And yeah. it says Juventus only for seven minutes, something. It's about one of the main teams. In, in okay. Italy. So it's for, and, and these guys have probably been meeting here on the Piazza for 20 years, 30 years. Easily, easily yeah. 40. And that's one thing I just love about the uh, Italian culture is it's in the streets. Everybody is there in this, this wonderful uh, uh, passeggiata. And uh, in many streets, uh, many cities have closed down their main drag to traffic. And uh, 
this I think this must be Florence I can tell because it looks like the the Duomo the tip of the Duomo is in the distance there at the top but you've got all every towns all over the place have this gather your friends it's all the generations the old people the young people the single people the couples the families you name it uh people showing off people gossiping people licking their ice cream cones uh in a lot of cases it's a genteel kind of thing in Rome it's kind of a it's more of a uh, it's a different ambiance on the streets of Rome. It's called the struccio. Can you tell us the about the, struc the struccio? Yeah, the struccio in Rome is struccio in dialect in Rome and in my area, central Italy, where I'm from, means to rub. You know, when you rub um, <laughs> each other's shoulder, you know, when you when you walk tight in a narrow street, you 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 actually hit somebody else. So that's the struccio. And if there's a girl or a boy that you like, you get closer and closer and closer with your with your so but just, that's the struccio. So struccio. it happens during the passeggiata, during the stroll, the harmonious, chaotic stroll. Now, of now if if I'm in a in an elegant uh, stroll like this, and you're out there, you know, if you're out, you're sing, you know, you're just they're appreciating the uh, people on the street. And uh, if a guy's looking for a girl, or if a girl's looking for a guy, they will compliment each other. You'll say bella, bello. You got to get the sex right on your terms, don't you? Bella would be talking to a woman. Bello would be talking to a man. Correct. Bella would mean pretty, pretty woman or girl. And bello would be handsome man or boy. Yes. And this, it would not be so delicate with this crowd, probably. They would no. talk to each other a little more aggressively. Yeah, these guys are uh, Rome, uh, AS Rome soccer uh, team supporters. And they're on the streets because Italian life is on the streets. Mediterranean life is on the streets. Yeah, I the love climate, that. Yeah, the climate helps with that, of course. Now, you're a musician, and uh, I love music. And I've noticed, uh, well, this happens to be in Florence. There's mm -hmm. quality street musicians, buskers, and it's not just ad lib. Uh, these people, I understand in Florence, the city actually makes sure they're they're talented and they say when and where they can play tell us about the busking scene in italy that way correct my band and i did it several times in modena ferrara florence and also we did it in smaller towns many towns especially the crowded places this is ponte vecchio in florence the old bridge i mean it must be controlled in a way otherwise it gets uh, flooded with terrible musicians and only a few of them are great musicians. This guy I know actually, and I know the bands that play here in on the Ponte Vecchio at night. They have a permit, so they get audited uh, professionally, yeah. audited by the the local authorities. And if they're good enough to perform live, if they have the right repertoire, right te technical skills and equipment, they can perform. And then they can busk and can sell their albums or, mm -hmm. or whatever they sell. And David, it's like a small concert. I mean, you can see the people sitting down across the way. They're there for a little while. They're just settling in and listening to it. And I love an evening, a couple hours after dinner in Florence or a place like that, enjoying quality street musicians. Now, another feature of the street is the is the motorini or what the motor, motorbikes, uh, Vespa. The yeah. we always, you know, the old movies in Italy, they always had a Vespa, didn't they? And and that's uh, Vespa means uh, mosquito, doesn't it? Or wasp, I guess wasp. 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 Yeah, and they make a little bzzz sound like a, a bee. Uh, it was quite noisy. I've spent many, many hours uh, in the wee hours in the old days trying to get to sleep with the Vespa noise. But I think Italy has made legislation that uh, prohibits noisy motorbikes now. Yeah, with new technology, now motorbikes are less and less uh, loud. But in the old days, until the 90s, the original Vespa was a 50cc, which was as annoying as a Vespa in your ears. That's why it's called Vespa, but it's so <laughs> iconic, you know, in, in many old Italian movies, the, you have beautiful international movies set in Italy with people riding their Vespa. Yeah. I just saw an episode of the White Lotus, one of the oh, uh, yeah. shows, and there's a, an important scene with a man and a woman riding a Vespa down in Taormina. Yeah. This, you know, I think I've been on a motorbike or a motorcycle maybe five times in the last decade, and it's all been in Italy. <laughs> yeah, we, we like our we like our two wheels. I have a, a scooter. Now these are bigger than a Vespa. These are bigger CC than a Vespa. Yeah. So they carry heavier weight, heavier duty, and they do better on roads and up yeah. and down hills. Yeah. Now another thing about Italy is you have taken very seriously the beauty of a pedestrian street. I remember this is the main street in the middle of Milano, going up to the Forteza, you know, from the Duomo to the Forte from the 
cathedral to the fort and yeah. it used to be a busy traffic street and now look at it, it's cobbled it's got a few service vehicles but only bicycles and pedestrians and the restaurants have tumbled out and they are set up here in the united states after covid we have some streeteries out on the streets but it feels like you're eating in a in a parking lot uh, but what they've done in Italy is they've really made them a permanent fixture. There's an elegance on the streets that used to be just noisy with cars. Yes. Um, in Italy, many, many historic center, centers have been turned, years ago, turned into pedestrian areas. And as I told you, Italians love their outdoor life to get mm. together, have a drink and chat. So. Now, my understanding, David, is a lot of the merchants didn't like it at first, but then they realized how good it was for their business. And then the people on the next street want their street to go traffic free also. True. American. True. Because if you want to have a beautiful drink between the Fortezza and the Duomo in Milan, you just walk there ah. and you can get there. And any, anyone can do it. It's flat. It's even. I love it. Yeah. And I love spend, I love sitting down and spending what seems like too much money for a drink because I'm not just getting the drink, I'm renting a little piece of real estate there for as long as I want to sit and enjoy the show. Here we are in Siena. And I just love this shot because I, I see there's a, looks like a spritz there. And in so many bars, here we have the Campo, the most expensive spot to be perched to watch the people go by in, in a very expensive touristy town, Siena. And if I'm looking at the receipt there, it's 11 euros for two cocktails with the little free munchies that come with it. That's $12 for two cocktails in the most expensive square in the most popular city with a small meal with it. It's an amazing value, isn't it? When you uh, enjoy that happy hour time. Yeah. And you can keep the table as long as you want. You don't have to order necessarily another drink. Right. You can stay there for half an hour, an hour, right. uh, people watching. Yeah. And here we have the spritz, very popular and the little munchies you get with it. So that's something to take advantage of. And a lot of Americans are a little timid about meeting people. This is the, the mark of a good traveler is how many conversations do you have with people who are not in the tourist industry? These are just students and they want to practice their English. They're confused about the United States. They want to talk to an American. You buy them a spritz, you've got two very good friends, don't you? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Italians are really fascinated about uh, people from other countries coming and visit to learn and understand the Italian culture. So the one of the reasons why I love guiding Rick Steve's uh, Europe tours is because we don't just show places like any other tour company. We put together the visitor to the, with the local and they get together. And this is an example. In this case, you're the visitor, allow me to say, and these people are the locals and age is different, doesn't matter. You it's get perfect. together, you, com you compare cultures and experiences experiences and at the end it's just a drink five euro and and you have a, an incredible outcome for the rest of your life i had a memory for the rest of my life david you're exactly right i remember i was at, in the same town i think it was a different occasion and i was at a table and i was um dipping talking to some people like this and i was dipping my bread into the um, plate of olive oil you know and mm -hmm. uh, and they told me you're making the scarpetta certo. <laughs> what is the scarpetta the little shoe, we call it, when you crack a little piece of bread, if the sauce is really good, or the olive oil in that case was really good, tasted so good, then you don't want to waste it. And then you can dip the slice, the little piece of bread, you rip a piece of the slice, and then you you uh, you scoop it out of the plate. Ah, I it happens love it. with pasta sauce often. Yeah, uh, It's actually a compliment to the chef. Ah, that's do, true. You, you do, do it right, it's a good compliment to the chef. Like in English, we would say, I want to lick the plate, you know. Yeah, same thing. Do you make the scarpetta? Ah, see. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I make the scarpetta. I love the life in the street. Uh, a lot of, first time I went to Naples, it was scary. Uh, but part of the, the thing that took me by surprise is people just want to be where the action is. I'm fascinated by the fact that Americans will pay more to get a quiet room on the backside and Italians will pay more to get a noisy room on the front side in a hotel. Yeah, closer to the core of the action. <laughs> Italians want to be right there. Look at that little kid on the motorcycle. He's right there in the scene. It's just, I just, I just walk in a different direction. There's a couple of neighborhoods in Naples. Sunny, Sanita, is that? Is Sanita, that Rione Sanita, yes. Oh, God, you just don't need a museum. You walk through the streets and it's like a trip. Yeah. Oh, when I was a kid, this is me back when I was a student. Uh, I had this uh, phrase I always used in my lectures. I would, I would just say, you got to be an extrovert. You got to meet people. The mark of a good traveler is how many real people do you talk to? If you see four cute guys sitting on a bench, 
ask them to scoot over, you know, and uh, I've been having that philosophy uh, all my days. I mean, just a couple of years ago, I was here in, in uh, Rome in, in, uh, in, the, in the ghetto. And yeah. uh, I just asked the ladies here, these are the ladies in the Jewish, the, the, the Jewish ladies that gather every day, you know, there, I was just there last um, couple months ago with um, Michaela, the best uh, guide in the ghetto. And uh, I learned that these ladies like to sit right under the windows of the schoolhouse so they can hear the children laughing. It's a beautiful uh, soundtrack for their social time. So yeah. I didn't realize that here, but we were sitting under the windows of the school, listening to the little kids of the neighborhood laughing and playing and just hanging out. You can sit on the bench with the locals anywhere in Europe. You can be in the markets. You can pay too much from your loaf for your loaf of bread like locals do in order to buy it from the person who baked it. This is family values in Europe. If you're in just tooling around like I was in Sicily and you stumble into a cheese festival, stop the car, get out, try some cheese. I mean, you could walk, this, these guys are in a town with no tourism. You could walk up to them and get into a great conversation. Um, and would they welcome you to just ask a few questions and learn about it, David? Definitely. Definitely. Engage with people. When you're in Italy, when you're in Europe, engage with people. Things are very different here. If you engage with the locals, especially if it's a vendor like these guys, they will be honored to try their very best to make you understand yeah. what they do, the way they do it, how long they've been doing it. And they will give you the finest and the best piece on, on in the shop, for sure. And yeah. uh, because... Look at these, these, these people are real working people. Um, and they're evangelical about their thing. Just like you like to share your music, they like to share their cheese. Yeah. So, you know, as a tourist, equip yourself with uh, some information. We have an Italian phrase book. It's got gestures in it. It's got all sorts of fun phrases. This phrase book, it, it falls to the cracks, but we have four different phrase books for the major languages for tourists in Europe. And it's got all sorts of ways where you can connect with the people. Uh, the other day, David, uh, in one of these uh, festival evenings, I went onto our website at ricksteves.com. I went into the section where we say travel talks. And there we have about 40 different kinds of topics that are, we have a lecture and it's all free. And we have four or five uh, sections for learning the language in all of these countries around Europe. And of course, it's just the beginning, but it's a couple hours of information about communicating and how well you communicate, even if you don't, quote, speak the language, really has a big determination on how many people you meet. I was in uh, the Cinque Terre, and I met the, uh, the, the uh, father who was the, running the little church above the town, and he invited me into the monastery. I, I, he, 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 I was just updating my book, David, and he said, uh, uh, we got to talking, and after a little while he said, would you like to come into the abbey and uh, try my homemade limoncello? Mm. What, do you, what do you think I said? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, That's baby. Where you, That's where you go, baby. <laughs> That's where you go, oh, baby. And you can tell right here, I'm getting drunk, with a beautiful monk and we are each creating a beautiful memory we're connecting we're celebrating we're sharing it was a it was a magical moment for me not drunk but just a little tipsy a little loose and we'll both remember that for the rest of our days another great way to connect with the culture is going to a soccer game you mentioned the guys are talking about soccer it's like a religion in italy isn't it mm -hmm. oh yeah definitely this is the stadium of AS Rome, uh, the Olympic Stadium in Rome, and it's it's a, it's an it's a cultural moment. Even if you don't understand the game, if you you don't support any of the games, the teams, it's fine. It's just be there uh, oh. with, the, with the crowd. Yeah, it is a cultural moment, and it's um some of the chanting is quite um, I think it's good natured, but it's quite violent. It's like. If somebody gets injured, we our our prayers our uh, players put go down on one knee and like gather around and pray. In in Italy in the soccer stadium, if somebody gets injured, they go, "It's okay, he'll come back next year in the B yeah. league, you know, in the next league down or something like that." Yeah, it, a lot of the chants in the stadiums are related to opera. You know, Italians like their opera, so they make up words in an opera like a Puccini or Verdi 
but then they they say insults and and, and very weird stuff during the game. <laughs> but it sounds like the opera you know oh that's beautiful i can just imagine some beautiful verdi melodic sort of theme with all sorts of insulting language for the bad yeah. guys yeah <laughs> Well, one thing fun about Europe, just in general, that I find, David, is just that it seems to me in Europe, people find their niche and they do it. I'm so thankful for the restaurant tours I know, for the hoteliers that I know, for the tour guides I know. And they're not here for a little while until somebody says you can do that and get more you know, respect or more money or something like that. This is what they're on the planet to do. And this is what they do. Uh, this is uh, Loris, and he runs one of my favorite restaurants in uh, Venice. And I've I've known him for 30 years. And his mom, I've I've known his mom for 30 years. And he's doing exactly what his mom and dad did. This is Nico. And um, I remember when uh, his mom and dad retired, I was sort of disappointed and kind of depressed because my favorite hoteliers in Venice were retiring and the younger generation took over. And for many years, I was visiting with Nico as I updated my books. And we had a tradition of always taking a photograph with this year's edition, holding last year's photograph, holding a photograph of the previous year's photograph as I would visit him every year or two. And we would just uh, rekindle our relationship and check in with each other. But Nico did the same thing as his parents and he found his niche uh, all over Europe. Don't, don't you find that there's something encouraging about people who know that this is what they're meant to do? Yes. Yes, they're never going to give you a bad uh anything like a bad hotel room a bad meal a bad piece of cheese the guys before they they, they are proud of what they do yeah. so they will do the best yeah and they will send you home with the best memory possible yeah. yeah my dad was that way with pianos you know he was a piano tuner and he sold pianos and he just all he wanted to do was give people what he called the steve's sound of music and we're giving people our very best as tour guides um Tell me a little bit about the market scenes, because that's something we can find in every town in Italy. Uh, what is your advice in a market? The mar so Italy is made of markets. Um, as I told you, people live outside, live outdoors, winter and summer. And the markets are uh, the best places for gathering, but at the same time, chit-chatting with your friends and neighbors and relatives while you do your groceries. You buy your groceries. And, and that's basically an outdoor museum of food in this case. Oh, yeah. Usually markets are divided into food section and non-food section. The food section is all fresh, strawberry, uh, fruit and vegetables, cheeses, salami, fish, uh, porchetta, whatever, depending on the area. In my area, they sell porchetta. In other areas, they sell other things. And then the non-food is more house supplies, shoes, clothes, and other yeah. things. So, so now here, David, if, I, if I'm looking at this correctly, this is asparagus sweet from Verona. Yep. This is strawberries from Campania, southern southern Italy. This is like five ninety per kilo, six euros per kilo. That means six dollars for two pounds, basically. So it's about three dollars a pound. And I see here Bianchi. We have white asparagus. Those mm -hmm. would not be here all the time, but if they're in season you'll find that on the menu tonight. And that's something worth doing, eating with the season, right? All the time. Whether you're in a restaurant, you're at home, Italians go with the season. Ita yes. it's the time of asparagus, you find everything asparagus, even the water, the yeah. flavor of the water is, is asparagus at some point. There are restaurants making desserts with asparagus, first, second courses, appetizers, Full asparagus. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, charming thing for me in, I think, Verona, they have a festival uh, where every year there's a special day when the older kids teach the younger kids how to make a good ravioli. And my understanding is they really care in so, every culture, I think, cares that the next generation will have grow up with an appreciation of what was um, distinguished by that region, what their beloved traditions they want the next generation to carry that on, and it's built into this little festival. Yes, we have thousands of food festivals in Italy. And yes, you're right. The, the passing from generation to generation is the key. It's mainly, uh, it's very important about the food, but not only about carpentry, masonry, about all the crafts, yeah. all the techniques that the older generation, the wiser generation, yeah. because they made it so yeah. far, can, you know, can teach 
It's yes, so generation. It's so beautiful that continuity, that cultural continuity. I, I remember when my dear grandmother was getting very old, she chose which one of her grandchildren to give her krumkaka iron, the uh, iron she made her special Norwegian pastry yeah. with. She gave it to me, <laughs> which was a mistake because I never, <laughs> I never cooked with it. But it was really important to her to know that we would keep that tradition alive. Uh, this guide here is a food guide in Rome, and I'll never forget when food tours came onto the scene. Now you find them everywhere. I'm just putting my schedule together for research in the spring, and I, I, when I make my schedule, um, I put 10 o'clock guide and 6 o'clock guide. And every day in the middle of the day, I get a guide for the history and the sightseeing. And every day in the evening, I get a food guide to help me understand the food scene in this or that town. And if you can take a food tour, it's a great opportunity. And this is another guide uh, that we use in Rome. And her and I were out looking at restaurants just a couple months ago. And what I like about this menu, uh, David, is it's handwritten, it's in one language, and it's small. That yeah. to me, I mean, that says Monday, the 21st of November, 2022, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what does that indicate to you when it's handwritten, small, and in one language? That is the place where you want to go as a visitor. Places like these is where you want to try the food. Because this food is exactly what you would find in an Italian home. Yes. Everything Casalinga. is fresh. If, if I, I can tell it's a Roman, it's a Roman uh, menu, also, um, of course, because of Ilaria, the tour guide, the local guide that I know very well. She's a great local guide. But also you can tell by the menu as a local that that's Roman dish. You know, yeah. carciofa la Judea, the yeah. Jewish artichokes of Rome. Oh, yeah. I mean, Look at that. Yeah. Cut, this, cut to the pepe. Yeah. Yeah. It's this, very good. You just don't. This is, the opposite is consider, uh, this is what Italians consider top gourmet cuisine. It doesn't matter the stars, yeah. the, the, the stars that you're given. This is the big deal. This is the real deal. Casalinga, that's a nice word. Casalinga means uh, yeah. home cooking in a restaurant, yeah. right? Yeah. It's the opposite. This is the opposite. This is on a famous square, very high rent. Uh, in, in, in English, it says no frozen food. And they have a big pre-printed menu that's the same all year long in five languages. Everything's wrong about that. You're going to eat with tourists and you're going to eat food that's been frozen um, or food that is out of season. Uh, oh, it's just you can do so much better. I love an antipasto buffet and you can just fill up a plate and it is for me, it's gone. We have a salad bar in our culture, uh, but uh, tell me a little bit of your take on the antipasto buffet. So this buffet for sure comes from the coastline, from the seaside, probably Cinque Terre or Amalfi or yeah. maybe Sicily or Sicily. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, you get a plate full. You can, you can uh, point and they will fill it for you or sometimes you do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. You got everything fresh. You've got yeah. the asparagus again. They come back. Uh, you've got some other greens and then you have uh, uh, a big, beautiful uh, seafood mixture. And oh, yeah. everything's incredible, fr incredibly fresh, I'm it's, sure. It's like a meal right there. It's just designed to be the appetite uh, opening course. But for me, it's lunch, you know, and it's meal. just yeah. very nice. Yeah. Oh, there's so much um, uh, we can be talking about. I want to talk very quickly about coffee. Uh, when you do eat in Italy, um, the coffee comes after the meal, right? Yes, coffee is the second to last thing. Uh, after coffee, you only have what we call the coffee killer, a mazza caffè, which is usually the di digestive, oh. the digestive drink like Amaro, Limoncello, Grappa. Mm -hmm. Uh, they say that helps trigger your digestion, but it's an excuse, I think. But anyway, coffee is the coffee is the closure element of a meal. Yeah, I, I you know I remember one of my very favorite eating memories. I was in a beautiful restaurant um, that I had just uh, outside of the center of town in Florence, and we had had a very convivial time. You know all the courses, and then in a conventional dinner you'd be done but then there was more and more and more and most of it was in different kinds of glasses and after a while the table looked like a chemistry lab and i just thought i'm having a lot of fun here and we've been sitting for an hour and a half after the meal was supposed to be over yeah that's that's very typical Italian, you know when when my friends from the us come for the first time they don't realize how different things are in a restaurant when you sit down at a restaurant the table is yours you can yeah. stay there for hours you can stay there until one until somebody kindly comes and like i need to go to bed <laughs> a three-year-old kid at they home. don't my wife they don't, is gonna... 
<laughs> they don't turn the table. They don't have to turn the table. No, uh, they never come. And, and oh. yeah. So there's such a great celebration of all of this, these dimensions. Um, boy, I'm having so much fun talking with you, David. I'm going to have to cut through a lot of slides here because I've got so sure. much fun memories of, of Italian uh, culture. Here we have in uh, in your your corner of the country, a uh, canteen, a cantina or a cellar, and it's mm -hmm. like a church lined with giant casks of wine. What do you That's make it. of this? Uh, this is most likely some incredible wine. It's probably Brunello. I cannot read, but uh, this is a, a, a very, very important winery. And uh, most of these places are underground. This is the barrel room. And yeah. um, and and these are the aging the aging barrels, oh. all made in incredible oak, probably French oak, which is supposed to be one of the finest. And oh. uh, we are full in this country. We're full of great wineries with oh. old traditions. Yeah, and we can visit. And the people who share the wine, this is Adamo, and I think Montalcino or Montepulciano. Yeah. And and then I found this in your town, outside of your probably ten minute walk from where you live. Yes. This is the filling station. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about the filling station. Have you ever been there? Oh yeah, my dad goes there every couple of months. He goes <laughs> with bigger jugs than yours, but um, yeah, yeah, you get there. Uh, I think up to date is like one fifty a liter, which is more than a bottle of wine. One euro fifty cent a liter, and you just fill it like in a car, so red that's, or white. That's, that's seventy five cents per bottle. That at that rate, yeah. You know? And, and this is the co-op, the local Orvieto co-op wine, right. which makes both white and red. And huh. instead of being labeled DOC, DOCG with more taxation, they just give you the, the, <laughs> the loose liquid. <laughs> oh, baby. And then, um, well, lots of tasting opportunities. One thing I like to do is to go to a small restaurant in Enoteca, where they serve fine wine and they know how to pair it with small plates of food. To me, you can try a very expensive bottle of wine without buying the bottle. You can just buy a 15 euro glass of wine and see why it's worth that and um, also have a beautifully paired plate to go with it uh enoteca is the word enoteca. i think yeah on our tours on our tours we we teach all of our friends visiting how to pair food properly uh, as funny. much as possible of course yeah. because we love that in italy we love that it's a big cultural thing and one way i like to pair is biscotti and vin santo does that kind of get you all excited just looking at that? Oh, yeah, because it's <laughs> from my area. So when I see Cantucci and Mixato, I see a home cook, cooked meal. I was We were with our guide teaching tour just last month when we saw you, and I had 20 guides, and we were all learning and so on. And um, I was at a restaurant that we go with our groups in Florence, and they came with the dessert trolley. You might know this restaurant. Uh, and all of these incredible desserts. And they looked at me, and they go, ah, yeah, the dessert uh -huh. for you is a very simple basic thing it's the dessert wine the vin santo and the biscotti sure. yeah uh, happiness hey i want to remind people i'm just kind of into italian food now because i've been working uh, in the last year we've been working on this guidebook at italy for food lovers it's out you can buy it at wherever you like to get your books you can find this book and it is 450 pages with appetizing photographs throughout and it has a hit already and if you love Italian food, even if you're not going to be traveling, this is a book that uh, Cameron in our office spearheaded the production here uh, in this hem in this uh, office. And then Fred Plotkin, who is um, he's just the go to guy for Italian uh, cuisine uh, and a very, very respected and wonderful guy. Uh, Fred co-authored the book with us and we're so excited to have this book out. I'll be working with with Fred. Uh, we're going to do some talks later. As a matter of fact, a week from Monday, Fred and I are getting together for our Monday night travel class. And we're gonna be talking about Italian food again uh, with Fred Plotkin as our guest. I do wanna remind everybody that, um, you know, we've been going every night for three weeks, um, but what we've been doing for two, more than two years before that is every Monday night and a week from tomorrow is the hundredth episode of Monday night travel. As I mentioned, I'll be with Fred Plotkin. We're gonna be talking about more about Italian food. Uh, and then every Monday after that, our team, Ben and Gabe and Lisa and Julianne will be here with, uh, I drop in every month or so, but we have wonderful themes coming up. 
And uh, uh, going forward now, we're just going to have one show per Monday. In the past, we've had two, an early show and a late show. Now we're just going to have uh, uh, one show, six o'clock on the West Coast, nine o'clock on the East Coast. It's free. It's if you've been, a lot of people have commented they're kind of addicted to the uh, nightly uh, talks here. Well, if you want to carry on, it's every Monday, Monday night travel. Uh, and I do want to remind you, all of the shows that we've done in the last three weeks are recorded and you can watch them. You could continue on for the next three weeks if you want, if you're, if you're stuck in this rut and just click there and watch the shows that you like. Hey, um, David, we were talking about music and uh, every corner of Italy has music. This is the Dolomites and they, it's like a bunch of German Schlager singers. In fact, curiously, the most famous Tyrolean folk band, or Schlager it's called, it's kind of schmaltzy, uh, you know, umpa music in, in uh, southern Germany and Tyrol, is uh, the Castleruth Boys. And Castleruth is our hometown in the Dolomites, uh, and they're really great. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, David Torty's band, Bartender, is a great opportunity. This was at our travel alumni party right here in Edmonds. You were on the biggest stage in town, blowing people away. And what I'd like to do right now, David, is... Uh, just um, let people enjoy a few minutes of uh, music that you were very gracious to perform for me and pre-record for this evening. And uh, I'm going to just roll this uh, in a minute and you'll set it up and then we'll talk for a second about that. But David, your, your sharing of culture through the music is something that is very inspiring to me. So this is six minutes and David's going to take us to three corners of Italy via the music. Here we go. I'm so, oops, let me be sure I've got, I want to be sure I've got, Gabe, was the music, was the audio okay there? I'm going to, yes, it's good. Okay. I want the very best quality sound for our time with David here. All right. Happy to have David Torty with us right now to demonstrate how guides can weave in their passions. And when we think about Italy, we think about music, we think about proud regions, and I love it when a guide can play to their forte, not just to be a, a, a copycat of Rick Steves, but to take our spirit of travel and then do it in a way that they just beam with passion and with creativity and with joy to celebrate their culture. Hey, David, you're a great musician. I love your band. People can look you up. It's called Bartender. If they, if they Google Orvieto and Bartender, I'm sure they can find it. Right now, can you take us to three regions in Italy to demonstrate how each region has its distinct culture and pride? Of course, Rick. First of all, thanks for having me here. And uh, yes, I have three songs in mind. I would like to name the cities of Rome, Naples, and Sicily, which is not a city, it's a region, but three, all three have an incredible tradition of music. So a uh, Roman song, typical Roman song of my area, this one, Tanto Ve Canta. Ve fa una vita mena mara, me son comprato sta chitarra, e quando il sole scende e mori, me sento un cuore cantatore, la voce è poca mantonata, non basta fa sta serenata, ma solamente fa maniera de dar menzogna prima sera. le canzone mie e marintonto io le bugie da ra ta ta da ra ta ta da ra ta ta ra ta ta ra ta ta da ra ta ta da ra ta ta da ra ta ta ra ta ta ra ta ta Bravo This was Rome and now just an hour and a half south of Rome another different, completely different world, the world of Naples, the oldest and most popular Italian uh, school of music, School of Naples, with its own beautiful tarantella and love songs. This one is called Osordato Namurato, and it's 
a song, a love, sto love story between a soldier who has to leave and leaving behind his loved girl. And the song goes like this. It's one of my favorite classical Neapolitan songs from the late 800s. <laughs> da sto a te volo con pensiero niente voglia e niente spero che tu pensi solamente a me si sicuro che sta amore come so sicuro di te Questo cuore si è stato o prima amore e o prima l'orte ma sarai per me. Oi vita, oi vita mia, oi cuore e questo cuore si è stato o prima amore e o prima l'orte ma sarai per me. And then, last but not least, the further south place of Italy and Europe, the oldest melting pot of the Western world, Sicily. And in Sicily, music is, has its own signature. And it goes, one of the many classics of Sicily is this one called Vittina Crozza. A very sad song performed in a beautiful, happy melody and rhythm, typical of Sicilian music, this incredible uh, oxymoron of negative, uh, sad, but happy, you know, like bittersweet life, you know, it's the biggest metaphor of life. And it goes like this. Si spiari, i dammari spugnia con gran dolori, muri vi senza auto, cudu campani, la 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 lera, la lera, la lera, la lera, la lera, la lera, la 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 lera, la lera, la lera, la lera, la lera, Oh, David, mille grazie. That is so beautiful. Grazie. Thank you. Grazie, Rick. Thank you so very much for having me. And um, I hope to see you and everybody else very soon. You're a great example of that theme we have of having our guides uh, play to their fortes, share their passions, and inspire us to connect with the rich cultures of Europe. David, thank you so much, and we'll see you on the road. Ciao. Ciao, grazie. Yeah. Well, David, that was really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. As a traveler, how would we find that kind of music? Where would we go in Sicily or Napoli or Rome to likely hear that? Well, often in local restaurants, not the mainstream restaurants, but like in right. neighborhoods, like residential yeah. neighborhoods, yeah. that would be like a duo or a trio, like my band, performing some yeah. local authentic music. I remember in Sicily, there's always uh, some districts in Palermo, Catania or Siracusa where you have local uh, street musicians performing authentic music, sometimes also on the streets, like like street, yeah. uh, like I've been, busking, you know, busking. I've been in restaurants in, in Florence, no, in Rome and Naples, not touristy restaurants, but local restaurants where you have wonderful music, just sort of ad lib, and it's just a beautiful thing. Well, yeah. thank you so much for that. That was really fun. And now we'll just we'll carry on a little bit. Um, gelato is a big part of Italian experience, I think. Uh, in a nutshell, what's your advice for travelers to understand the best gelato? Best gelato, never look for the big fluffy mountains of gelato, but look for the regular tubs, you know, like these ones you're showing in the picture. Even better, sometimes, even if you don't even see the color, the right. covered tubs with the lids. And then the color of the gelato flavors need to be natural. Strawberries, 
That's the strawberry color. Pistachio right. is not neon green. Pistachio yeah. is like brown. So right. pistachio needs to be lo looking like brown and so on. So colors of nature, look for that and yeah. no big mountains. And it's a treat. And it's important to remember that there's a lot of uh, gelatrias that just snare the the hot and, and uh, tired tourist by having mountains of brightly colored gelato. And that's the wrong thing to look for. Very I mean, important. They're, okay. they're just OK. They're yeah. not fine. They're but, not the fine quality. Yeah, but life's too short not to have the best gelato when you're in Italy. Wow. A uh, sciaparo, sciaparo, an important word when we're traveling. Strike. It means strike. And in Italy and France, we love our strikes. Yeah. So, what? yeah. Um, when you see a sciopero, like the first word in, highlighted in, in, in yellow, uh, call Rick Steve's office or, <laughs> or ask some locals how to deal with the sciopero. <laughs> hey, I've been, I've been with a whole tour bus and tomorrow the trains are going on strike, you know, and you need to know what's happening. Usually the, the strikes are going to be what we call nuisance strikes. They don't, it's not going on strike like forever. It's just next Tuesday, they're going on strike. And then next Friday, they're going on strike just to cause a problem and to raise their voice. And here we have an example. Uh, that's sciopero uh, ferroviario. That's uh, the train strike. Railroad, and it's a, a, a tension. Uh, the trains are going to go on strike on April 14 and April 15. So either go early or go late or anticipate some problems. But uh, you need to be um, on the ball to navigate around the strikes. I've been traveling in Europe all my life, and there's been strikes all the time, and it's never been mission critical. We just it's it can be a little bit of a confusion. Um, and uh, tell me, you got a lot of. Um, uh, uh, what do you call it? well uh carabinieri there's different carabinieri. Dif different words for the police in italy you see different branches of the police what's what's how do we understand what we're looking at yes yeah, so uh like in the us in italy we also have we have um the state police which is what we call polizia which is uh -huh. private it's not well, well well the carabinieri is a branch of the army so these people are soldiers former soldiers that then i mean still soldiers that went through the military career yeah. And then we have the Guardia di Finanza, which is the financial guard, which is basically a mix of IRS and police. So they investigate on scams, on drug dealing, uh, mm -hmm. illegal, you know, mafia, uh, mm -hmm. corruption, and so on. And they all together work together like the FBI in the United States, like the Federal Bureau of yeah. Investigation. They've got a big responsibility and um, Italy is a crowded, crazy place and there's lots of tourism and a lot of money and, uh, you know, um, a little bit of risk from petty, petty purse snatching and pickpocketing point of view. We should be mindful of that. Um, I'm going to go pretty quickly here. I do want to remind people when you go to a big city in Italy, if you look at the map, a lot of times you can actually see where the medieval wall was, can't you, on the map? Yeah. Nothing has changed in Florence, I have to say. <laughs> look look at that. I mean, they tore down the wall, and that's a circular yeah. road that goes out from the river. But you can actually see that circular road that used to be the map. To me, it defines where the historical sites are. And the city could sprawl forever. But that's what you want to be uh, focusing on in your travels, is the historic core of the city like that. Yeah. Another um, sort of a feature of Italian cities are hill towns. I think after Rome fell, uh, there was a power vacuum and the people just literally ran for the hills and they established hill towns in the early Middle Ages, uh, or they took refuge in the hill towns. You live in a hill town, Orvieto, yep. and nearby, just an hour away from you, what do we have here? Civita di Bagnoreggio, yeah, half hour, it's very close. Yeah. Um, Civita di Bagnoreggio is one of the hundred hill towns. This is kind of one of the quintessential hill towns of Italy because it's also called the dying town, the town that dies because there's only seven or eight residents up in Civita as we speak. Yeah. Um, but now it's become a destination and the, 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 the geology of it, you see on the right, you see clay hills, on the left, you see green hills because the hill town of Civita is, is built on top of two plateaus, two, two, two formations that, that meet and created this hilltop. So it's a unique setting, I mean. Just uh, it's beautiful. And you can walk up that do the modern donkey path and get in there. And it's it's quite an experience. San Gimignano is another uh, town on a hill. And here we see another feature of Italian towns. And that's all of these individual towers of noble families. And if we go back into the Middle Ages, um, you know, you think of uh, Shakespeare's uh, Romeo and Juliet. 
Well, that was two families that probably each had their own tower, the Montagues and the Capulet, right? They were feuding. They had their own, they were warlords, essentially. They had their own private armies and they had their own towers. They had their own treasury. And um, you have that, uh, the remains of that kind of feudalism or that fragmentation with a, with a lack of a strong central power all over Italy. But most of the towns don't have their original skyline because when a king or somebody came in and they said, okay, we're going to establish a central power, the first thing they would say is, noble warlords, you got to cut your tower down. And all over Italy, you'll find the stubs of towers that used to be like San Gimignano. Mm -hmm. But somehow San Gimignano's towers remain standing. Yeah, for several reasons, San Gimignano, some of the towers remain standing. San Gimignano was, uh, was uh, counting over 100 towers in mm. the in the middle ages it was an incredible it was it's called the medieval manhattan because yeah. it looked like skyscrapers yeah um but Crazy. towers for a reason and 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 city walls for another reason city walls because we didn't need to defend ourselves anymore after the unification uh -huh. of Italy. so most of them were recycled right Same for towers it was too uncomfortable in the 17 1800s to go all the way up to a tower when you could go and live a, an easier life at the ground we floor you know, one of our hotels, uh, La Torre Guelfa, we just stayed in in Florence. Yeah. Our group stayed there and it's got a tower. And now you climb up to the very top of the tower and there's a little uh, place to have a glass of wine up there. It's quite nice with the beautiful view of yeah. Florence. A lot of people complain about the crowds of Italy. It's such a popular place to go. You have to take the initiative to avoid the crowds. Get up early before breakfast and take an hour long walk in Venice or, or be out late in Florence after everybody's back at the hotel and you'll enjoy those towns without the crowds. And it's getting hotter and hotter. Uh, <laughs> this is the mark of a good tour guide is to know where to park your group in the middle of the day if it's really hot, like in the shade of this obelisk while you're seeing St. Peter's. Another dimension of Italian sightseeing is the overlay of ancient Greece. Um, 500 years before Christ, uh, the northern part of Italy was Etruscan and the southern part was Greek. In fact, uh, southern Italy was a Greek colony called Magna Grecia. Where, where are your favorite Greek ruins in Italy, David? Wow. Uh, Pestum near Naples, but also, I mean, Sicily. Sicily has mm -hmm. an unbelievable amount of, of Greek, ancient Greek ruins. Oh, it's, it's really something. Agrigento. My goodness, I, uh, I may, you could make a case that the best Greek, uh, some of the best Greek ruins are actually in Italy. This is the theater in Taormina in uh, in Sicily, a uh, reminder of the Greeks. Uh, and of course, Italy has its Riviera. You've got famous resorts and you've got funky little towns like this that were too remote to get developed. And that's kind of my cup of tea. So we have the Cinque Terre yeah. and we have romantic places. Um, if you were going to have a friend that was going to be having a honeymoon in Italy, what are the top four or five places you'd recommend for a romantic getaway in Italy? I mean, Eric, this is a difficult question. This is, you put me in a tough spot. So in this picture, it's Lake Como is in my top five. Okay. Sure. Lake Como. That's, that's honeymoon country. The Italian word again, Luna di Miele. Luna di Miele. Yes. Lake Como, the Northern Lakes, Lake Como, Lake Garda, but Lake Como, especially the Northern mm -hmm. Lakes, you choose. Uh, then I would say totally the Italian Riviera. So either Cinque Terre or, or any of the other towns of the Italian Riviera, mm -hmm. the Amalfi Coast or Capri, spectacular mm -hmm. place. And I would definitely say something like um, Sicily, Sicily mm -hmm. for sure, Trapani or, or, or Siracusa or Taormina. In Cefalu, Cefalu. In Cefalu, yes, Cefalu, Maybe. correct. Also Sardinia. Sardinia is another place that Sardinia. many Italians, yeah. I, I was learning. I was learning from Fred. I was talking to him about Sardinia because there's a chapter in this exciting new book, Italy for Food Lovers, by Rick Steves and Fred Plotkin. I don't know anything about Sardinia, but we were talking about the cuisine there, and it's not a fishing cuisine because because of malaria and because of pirates. For most of its history, everything on the island of Sardinia was in the interior, and the coast was their back was to the coast. And then when the malaria subsided and the pirates were gone, then they could get down to the coast and get into the fact that they are an island. But Sardinia, uh, it's interesting to hear you say that is a romantic getaway also. I would add Siena. I love Siena. Bella. Siena, yes, yeah. I agree. Siena and the Tuscan countryside as well. Oh, 
There's a well, in the heart of it. Yeah, Italy's got so much. It's got mountains too. This is a this is Saceda, and the Dolomites are a place that are quite popular these days with hikers. I'm dreaming of going on an extended hike up there. And for me, a charming place, and we go there on our tours, is the highest alpine meadow in Europe. I understand, um, and it is Alpi di Susi. Mm -hmm. uh, and up there, it's just like it's kind of like going to the beach, but it's high altitude, and you got grass instead of sand, and you got you know you can pet the animals in the farms and you can hike along the ridges and it's really quite something. And here, like in so many cases, you've got that regionalism. I love the concept of, well, the, I love to remember that when Italy was united, when was that like 1870, the George Washingtons and Thomas Jeffersons of Italy said, okay, now we've created Italy. Next, we have to create Italians. Mm -hmm. We're still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Tell if us about I speak this. to any of these guys in the picture in our own accent, we do not understand a thing at all. Wow. Which is yeah, pretty amazing, I have to is. say. Then we can go speak to speak Italian and we'll understand. Yeah. But but the dialect. Yeah, our, we have we have many dialects, hundreds of different accents, many, many dialects. Many people don't understand that until they come over here, but yeah. Yeah. it's a very it's still a baby country. Italy is a baby country. Many people think Italy is old, but the peninsula is old, but the, the country is a baby country, younger, 100 years younger than America. It, that's interesting. We got to remember in 1850, there was no Italy. You're looking at little countries that are long gone now. Yeah. Uh, and thankful we have guides like you. Look at there's David Torty working in his hometown, taking our group to the great uh, cathedral right there in Orvieto. That was great, David, when you took us around through the, uh, the Duomo. Uh, this is a, a reminder that we have local guides, like we had you in, in uh, Orvieto, we have Annie in Volterra. Uh, it's so nice to tap into local guides on our tours. I do want to remind our travelers that if you're not going to take a tour and you, you, you don't have uh, the budget for that, you can uh, just get my app. It's free and it's got guided tours to all the most important sites and just pop me in your ear. And I'd love to walk you through my favorite places. It's an app. You can get it on the App Store. It's free again. And it's uh, it's called Rick Steves Audio Europe. And we're just working very hard. I've been working on it this weekend. As a matter of fact, we're updating all of our 65 tours on there. So they are just perfect for your travel joy. Um, OK, we are out of time, but I'm going to let you tell us about truffle hunting because I love to stay with Isabella and Carlos at a Agriturismo somewhere in Tuscany or Umbria and go truffle hunting. Yeah. What's the deal? So in Italy, we have, um, we're lucky because geologically speaking, we have a very special kind of soil, many kinds of soil, different soil. And one of the specialties is that in some specific areas of the country where I am from, Umbria, but also the famous area of Piedmont, Northwestern Italy near towards France, we have this unique soil that generates this incredible fungus, which if you say like that, it sounds like, whoa, what is that? It's a truffle. It's a fungus that grows in lack of oxygen underground. That's why you need dogs that can smell the gas leaking from the underground and bring it to the surface. And you just brush the, you, you brush the truffle. This gentleman is holding a fresh truffle, just, just freshly uh, dug out. You brush it, you do not wash it, and you shave it raw on the food. And it tastes like heaven. Oh, it's as simple it, as that. It really does. Now, the white truffle is more expensive. This is a black truffle, right? But it's expensive it a, also. What this would is you, a black truffle, yes. What would you guess that would cost in the market? This one, according to the guy's outfit, is probably not a full winter truffle. This is probably Scorzone. I would say that one would cost maybe 30, 40, 50 euro, depending on the variety. There are 11 kinds of black truffle. Yeah. Okay, so Only 30 bucks or 40 bucks for a, for a truffle the size of a carrot. Um, yeah. And um, uh, by the way, a euro is essentially a dollar now, so just think par, but boy, it, when the truffles are in season, it's worthwhile. All over Italy, we can check in with um, artisans, craftspeople that know their trade, and they just are, are artists in their trade. Of course, you've got glass blowing in Venice, We've got alabaster in uh, Volterra, uh, and uh, that's just a beautiful opportunity. And uh, also down in um, Lazio and Umbria and Tuscany, uh, we have, uh, what, what is going on here? Uh, so this, uh, these people are in Deruta. This is my colleague uh, Nina, Nina Bernardo, and my friend Carlo in Deruta. Carlo is a ceramic maker. They've been making ceramics their whole life and for generations. They're glazing the ceramic. 
they're putting the glaze on the ceramic so that then they can paint it once the glaze is dry and then they will fire it again. C huh. Ceramic is fired twice. And this Orvi is the final result. And Orvieto is famous for its ceramics, isn't it? Orvieto is famous for its ceramic. Deruta is the capital city of Umbria, my region, for ceramics. But yeah. in the old days, Deruta and Orvieto had this, uh, this kind of, you know... Uh, Beautiful. I should get... I've never taken any of those home. I should try that. And here's Cesare. I, th these are people, again, who found their niche. And he, he loves to have people just looking over you know through his door when he's doing his work he's the venerable uh, coppersmith in the town of uh, montalcino or multipulciano I think multipulciano, is multipulciano. Yes, and yes. uh oh what a what a wonderful what a delightful man and he, i don't he's not that important it's just in, in in your travels everywhere you go you can connect with people like like cesare who have so much heart and soul in their work david um we're out of time I just would like if you could give us um, literally a 30 second review of each of these itineraries, just give us um, a one quick over of where we go on the different tours and I will go ahead with the slide when you're done. Of course, so this is the 17 day best of Italy tour and touches northern and central Italy. And in 17 days, it's the most extended tour of Italy. We touch so many different regions, so many different cultures within the country of, of Italy, so many different dialects, so many different foods. And, 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 and histories and, and everything, everything's oh, so man. different. We start in uh, Varenna uh, on Lake Como, we go up to Dolomites and then we see outstanding Venice. We get into the heart of Tuscany and each stop we stay at least for two nights and we get to meet the people and learn about the place. We see the Cinque Terre, the Italian Riviera, then we stop in romantic and outstanding Siena, the oldest historic uh, pedestrian downtown in Europe, remember 1966, we were talking about it earlier. Yeah. And then we stop in my region of Sisi, the, the town of St. Francis, and we end up in the big capital city of Rome. So in 17 days, you have an out, outstanding blast of Italy. I love it. And notice that every night, every stop is two nights. This is so important. We like to, sometimes you have to do a one night stop, but we like to minimize those. And in this case, we've batted 1000. Every stop is two nights. The same thing with this tour. Uh, yeah. In this tour, we'd start in Rome. And I like this because it's balanced. We've got the grand city of Rome. Uh, you've got the best, my favorite hill town, Volterra. Uh, my favorite chunk of the Riviera, the Cinque Terre. And then the art capital of Europe, Florence. What a beautiful itinerary if you've got nine days. Uh, going into the south of Italy, this would be a good follow-up to the best of Italy. This is the best of South Italy. Uh, talk us through that one, please. Uh, yes. So we begin in Rome, perfect for flying into, uh, but we see Rome in a slightly different way than on the best of Italy and the heart of Italy. So it gives you a more extensive understanding of the, the eternal city. I mean, Rome, you can spend three months and never see the same thing twice. And then we go from Rome into the Gargano Peninsula, into the northern area of Puglia, one of the least uh, known regions of Italy. It's becoming more popular now, but you will get to see the Adriatic Sea from a promontory of the Gargano. Amazing. And then Alberobello, the, the town of the Trulli, the, the cone-shaped cone roof uh, um, constructions, ancient constructions. And then we go to Matera. Matera is one of those places that you see and then you're like shocked for a week. It's an incredibly beautiful town and the food is outstanding. And then you go to Pestum, to the Greek ruins of Pestum, the temples of Pestum. Spend lots of time in the Amalfi Coast and the Sorrento Peninsula. So two nights in Amalfi Coast with Positano and, and two nights in Sorrento, talking about romantic and amazing food and people. Oh. And then we end up in Naples which is to me one of the most underrated and yet most beautiful cities in Europe. And I want to stress, um, if you if you want more information on that, we snuck the best of South Italy in with our Sicily program in this festival. And Tommaso, who's one of our Sicilian guides, also does the South Italy tour. He did a wonderful job of explaining this route to us with photographs. And I also want to stress that even if you're not going to take a tour, please take a hard look at these itineraries and learn from them because our guides work very hard to make sure that these are the best use of your time. And uh, while well, if you went on your own, you'd have to add a few more days to do it. Uh, it really is an opportunity to take advantage of our experience and put your own tour together. This is called a My Way tour. And we do a few regions in Italy that are unguided. 
I just like the efficiency of people sharing a bus and us lining up the great hotels. And we have one of our guides going along as an escort, but not doing any formal guiding. Everybody gets the guidebook and they get the app and they get no stress because you got all the hotels and transportation figured out. And this would be a great couple of weeks in Italy. And it cost about a thousand dollars less than the fully guided tours. So it's great if you want to have a little more independent time and save a little money. And of course, Sicily is one of our most popular tours these days. And this is a very busy 11 days. I took this tour just because I wanted to enjoy Sicily with our great guides there. And I was blown away by the food. And when I was researching for our guidebook, I came back with our TV crew and we had to do two shows on Sicily. There's just so much there and it fills 11 days. That's for sure. And um, this is sort of the, the, the greatest hits in 10 days, the three most exciting cities, arguably, that you could visit and uh, Venice, Florence, Rome, connected by a three hour bus ride between each. What an itinerary. Uh, Village Italy. Uh, this is our last one to talk about, David. Just Village Italy, I took my family on this tour because we had seen all the famous things, but we wanted to get closer to the, the pithy, substance, the, the salt and the earth of Italy, like what we've been talking about this last hour. Tell us about, give us a walk through this itinerary just briefly, please. Yes. Once, one of the first times I met you, I remember you describing this tour as the backbone of Italy, because this is the real backbone of the country. We go into seven regions out of 20, Italy is divided into 20 regions, seven regions. We start in Padua, the second oldest universities in the world. Uh, from the early 1200s. We explore Padua, we discover the Chapel of Giotto, we stop for the day in Ravenna to see the Byzantine mosaics of Ravenna, seven UNESCO sites in a town that's two miles long. I mean, amazing. Just, just to think about it still, I'm, I have goosebumps. And then from there, you go into Assisi, the town of St. Francis. We spend the day in Assisi and we go for two nights in Montefalco, a hilltop in Umbria, where they make the incredible red wine Rosso and Sagrantino di Montefalco, another phenomenal red wine from Umbria. And then, of course, we go home. For me, we go home because we go to Orvieto. Halfway through the tour, we stop in Orvieto for two nights. That's when I change my laundry. <laughs> Perfect. And, uh, <laughs> and then we visit my hometown, Orvieto, a beautiful little town between Tuscany, Umbria, and Lazio. We take a couple of day trips from there. And then we, ah, on the way, we stop at the ceramic shop in Deruta to show the working the from A to Z, how the, the process of making ceramics of Deruta has been going on for centuries. And then we go north, northeast into Tuscany. Uh, we visit Siena, we stay in Chianti. Amazing, amazing area. Most people know and you, you heard of. And then we stay in Lucca for two nights. Lucca is one of the few towns in Europe that has the original medieval city wall still intact because they kept them for defensive purposes, but they never actually really needed them. And then we visit the Carrara marble quarries. That's when we go up to the mountains of, uh, the mountain of Carrara, where the Romans already 2000 years ago started carving this pure white marble that everybody knows. When you think of marble, you think of Carrara, and mm. uh, which is still in Tuscany, by the way. And then a mile after you enter the region of Liguria, the Italian Riviera, we spent two nights in the Italian Riviera, explore the Cinque Terre. That's where we have our vacation from our vacation. And then we end up for one night only, but it's definitely worth the drive, Lake Orta, one of the smallest and most incredible alpine lakes of Northern Italy. And you connect very easily to the airport in Milan from there. Yeah. And David, just to hear you pronouncing the towns correctly is music to my <laughs> ears. It's so nice. Thank you for giving us a rundown on that. Yeah. And of course, the best of Tuscany. Hey, I want to remind uh, all of our, our guests that we have two more hours earlier in this month that we recorded. Uh, one show on Italy's cities, Venice, Florence, and Rome with Anna, and then David joined us uh, uh, 10 days ago in Italy's countryside. So if you're curious about those, you know how to get them. Again, all of that information is right there on our website, and uh, uh, including a quick and easy look at all well over 100 shows that we've done. I think we've done 18 shows on Italy for more information for people who are excited about turning their travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality. Tomorrow night, we're gonna draw two more tickets, two more free free tours. Uh, if you're gonna join our party tomorrow night, uh, and of course the, the sale for the festival is going on until the end of the month. Um, tomorrow night is the grand finale. I've invited our staff over. So it's just gonna be pandemonium, I think. And I've got some cool, cool video clips to share. You're gonna love this grand finale. If you can uh, do it, we'll see you tomorrow night. 
Uh, I want to thank our Monday night travel crew, Lisa, Ben, Julianne, and Gabe. These four are heroic. They've been with us every night for the last 20 nights. And they're going to be with you, all of you travelers who like Monday night travel going forward. These are the four, the Monday night travel team that have been doing 100 episodes of Monday night travel. And we've got 100 more on the way. So I personally want to thank you for for getting us through this crazy festival. And tomorrow we're gonna to be over here partying, celebrating all the fun we have had sharing our love of Europe. So with that, I'd like to take it back to Ben and uh, thank you, David, for uh, breaking into your family time and sharing your wisdom about Italy with all of us. I learned a lot. Grazie, Rick. Thank you so very much for having me. It's been a great pleasure as usual. Thank you, Ben, and the whole staff, Julianne, um, Lisa, and Gabe. Uh, really, it's been a, an honor and a pleasure. Nice. Hey, um, Ben, you must have some questions. Absolutely, Rick. A lot of questions. We'll start with a few food questions. This one is really difficult. Think a moment. What is your favorite gelato flavor? Are you asking me? Both of you. Ah, you go first, Rick. Riso. Riso. Rice. Rice. Certo? Rice. Wow. Rice. If you ever see rice on the list, you don't see it very often, but there's something, I guess I like tapioca. And the rice gelato is really good. Yes, it is. It's actually one of my favorite. Come on, really? Yeah. Nice. I, I like riso. Si, si. Riso. Yeah. Riso. And it's also, um, of course, well, there's a lot of good flavors. What's your favorite other than riso? Right now, as we speak, my favorite is Cassata Siciliana, but in an hour, it's going to be another one. Uh, Cassata Siciliana is a Sicilian mix of candied fruit, ricotta, and other ingredients that create the Cassata cake, and they also make it into a, a gelato flavor. Right now, I'm craving for it because I cannot find a Cassata in Boston that I know of. <laughs> Good luck, yeah. <laughs> Mine would be pistachio, but I'll have to try what you two yes, suggested. Yes. We have another food question from Robin. She would like to know if you are in Italy and could only order one thing, which fortunately probably won't be the case, but hypothetically, what would you get? Are you talking about one object? Food. Oh, one, one food item. <laughs> Mamma mia. Uh, <laughs> That's a funny uh, question. <laughs> something portable home. If it were to be transportable home, I will vacuum seal an amazing, amazing piece of 36 month old Parmigiano mm. cheese. Parmigiano cheese. That's that's something I really I could die for every day. Mm. If it's something that's perishable that I need to eat on the plane, uh, a Sicilian cannolo. Cannolo. Mm -mm. I never knew cannolo. That's cannoli singular. Cannolo. Si, cannoli. Sorry. Yes. Cannolo. Yeah, uh, cannolo. I got to you know because we eat cannoli here and there and it's just generally mediocre, I think. In yeah. Sicily, when you have a fresh cone and you fill it with the ricotta right there, oh. and it's done really well, like good enough for the Sicilians. I don't go crazy for those kind of sweet desserts very often. I could just sit there and weep with joy as I nibble on my cannolo. The cannolo in Sicily, I mean, is the cannolo. The first time I got at the Sicily tour years ago, I remember first breakfast at the first hotel. Mm. I was assisting a great colleague of mine and, and I was like, I was in shock for like two hours. I couldn't speak. Oh, I was yeah. like, this is yeah. the tour I need to lead. By special <laughs> request, you know, David, by special request, we pay our guides in Sicily by cannoli. See, si, see, si, it's okay. I, I accept it. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Deal. Okay. <laughs> Good. Next question. I think our next question will be for our viewers, actually, Rick, because we have a poll. Okay. So I'm going to launch this poll. We would like to know, out of the 21 presentations so far in our Europe Festival, how many have you attended? And Rick, I think we can give our, our viewers maybe 20 or 30 seconds to fill this in. But I would like to know, Rick, how many have you been to so far? Yeah. Hey, when we set, when we embarked upon this, Ben, I thought I would take five nights off. So thank goodness, Cameron and Steve Smith and Cameron Hewitt did three. Steve Smith did France and Lisa Friend, one of our Monday Night Travel crew, did England. And I think for like three or four of those, I couldn't stay away. I, I remember thinking, great, I don't have to work, but I just 
pulled up a chair and I had my dinner and I watched you guys working and it was great. So I went to 20, I went to 18, let's say, <laughs> but I bet somebody, I, I have no idea if people did a lot or, or a little. I think I'm at 15, Rick. So I think you've beaten me. And, and David, you're at two, I'm guessing. You're the only uh, guy who come back for a second one. I'm actually at three. I watched one. Which one did you watch? As a viewer. Uh, last night's Greece. Ah, Greece. That was fun. Okay, do we have the uh, tally there? I think this thing can just do it right. This is so uh, unimaginable. Do. Here are the results. There we go. Wow. Impressive. Look at how many people did 15 to 20. 31% of the respondents. Is that, am I reading it correctly? That's correct, Rick. And 15% did every single one. <laughs> Whoa. Well, you guys are great. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. That is just mind blowing. We're going to have to do this again. So uh, that's very nice. Thanks, Ben, for doing that. Yeah, incredible. Incredible. Well, we have a great question from Joe. I'm curious to hear what you'll have to say about this. You've both been engaging with Italy for decades as a native, as a traveler. How do you think Italy has stayed the same and how do you think it's changed? Huh. Wow, that's a good question. It's a very good question. Italy used to be so chaotic and mm -hmm. so full of cons and all sorts of problems from a traveler's point of view, because you didn't speak the language, people didn't speak the la English, and they, they didn't have enough coins. So different regions would print their own little paper money, you know, and you'd have, they'd give you candy in, in return for your change. And to make a phone call, you had to get a jetone and uh, you had to change money and people were on strike or things were closed and you couldn't change money. And, you know, the, the, there was just, for somebody who didn't know how to travel very well and who didn't speak the language and didn't have a lot of money, and there was a thousand lira in a dollar, um, it was kind of a fun challenge just to deal with the bella chaos of Italy. And that chaos is gone now. I mean, you can, the, the, the transportation, public transportation is great. The driving is great. I went to Naples once. So I went to Rome and I had in my script that the traffic stays in lanes like rocks in an avalanche. Avalanche. That was the line. In Rome, traffic stays in their lane like rocks in an avalanche. And I couldn't find any chaotic traffic. It was actually orderly. Um, so my sense is the beauty of Italy is still there, but the frustrating kind of chaos is 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 old old news yeah i think in a nutshell that's exactly it i mean 30 40 years ago very few people very few travelers would come to italy for an experience because it would be most places would be complicated inaccessible no infrastructure no travel tourist infrastructure i'm thinking about places for example like imagine sicily 30 years ago 40 years ago sicily it would have been very difficult to take the itinerary that we do, for example, the 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 twelve day tours, eleven day tour of Sicily. Most of the roads weren't there. Uh, there were actually no roads. It, was, it wasn't that the roads were bad. There were no roads, and, and they were not drivable. And the towns were not ready to receive any groups bigger than two people. You know, it, and I'm mentioning Sicily, but I could mention many other regions of Italy. Um, only the big hits we're already ready, you know, Venice, mm -hmm. Florence, Rome, Milan, Naples, not a chance. Naples was not a big hit. It's not yet. Uh, places like Puglia, Sardinia, nobody even knew about. Nowadays, Italy has bigger infrastructure. The, the, the local economy has grown dramatically within the last 30 years, fortunately for us, and people's conditions and, and quality of living. Nowadays, Italy is a, is a, is a country that's considered, you know, it's in the G7, the, the economy, even though they always say we have bad economy, we're a very productive country. So money comes around in the country and tourism is a huge part of our economy. And that's why most of the regions now are accessible and some more popular than others, but Italians are uh, very authentic people. And wherever you go, whether it's Rome or it's the smallest village, in the most remote region of Italy, you will get in contact with some incredibly authentic uh, Italian culture and experience. Yeah, you can still meet a, 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 a farmer in a village in the Cinque Terre who takes you into his cellar with a long straw 
and drink wine right out of his cask. I mean, it's just, there is so much authenticity there. It's just mind boggling. And it, at the same time, it's a affluent in modern society. So, but Italy still has the Bella chaos. Yeah, he has to still has the Bella chaos and it's easily more easily reachable and accessible. That's why mm -hmm. I really like um, guiding in my own country. Had I had I been guiding 30 years ago, Mm, no, it would be so it's, it was frustrating. It, it would have been a nightmare. Yeah, I was guiding 30 years ago. Yeah, it was frustrating. Now what you can actually about. promise something and it's going to happen. Yeah. And worst case scenario, you always go for, uh, OK, guys, coffee and coffee's good. So. <laughs> Aaron would like to know, since you're both outside of Italy now, Rick, you're near Seattle and David, you're in Boston. What do you miss the most not being in Italy? What draws you back? Energy in the street. When I walk down the street here, there's people are inside watching TV. When I walk down the street in Italy, even even in the off season, even when it's cold, people are out. People, Italians are animals for the social connectivity, I think. It must have been so tough, David, during COVID for you guys to be all in your apartments locked away yes. because Italians need to be in the piazza. The piazza, I often wonder why I like Italy so much. You get it right down to it, one word, the piazza. I think it goes all the way back to Roman times, but that's where people come together. Oh, the piazza. Yeah. What I would give to have a piazza in my town. You know, we're afraid of that. We just, we just got to have, we, we got to be in our cars and we got to have the, the big efficiency of a giant mall or something like that. But there's that wonderful intimacy and that multi-generational festival of life that you can't avoid when you're in Italy. The, yeah. Same for me. The the get together, the the easy the easy the the ease of getting together. In Italy, you you get together even if you don't want to. You kind of force. <laughs> That's to. so true. Whether you like it or not, yeah. you're together. You know, we don't have a word for privacy in Italian. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Because we have no concept of privacy nowadays. Modern life, yeah, sure, but we take the English word called the privacy. <laughs> Except you, you roll the R, privacy. Privacy, see, privacy. We don't have the word. But yeah, the, the ease, how easy it's to get together. And yeah, the piazza is, piazza is our social network. The piazza or the plaza for the Spanish, you know, it's the social network. It's where you get together, when you, you gossip, when you, where you fight, where you compare, where you debate, you know. That's the real deal. That's something, it's, it's very easy to do in Italy. It's not as easy in, in other countries. Okay, we have time for just one more question from Julie. We'll start with you, David, and then Rick, you can, you can answer for us. If you had to choose between Italian food and Italian music, you could only pick one, which would you choose? Uh, that's, that's not fair. That's not fair. Don't answer that question. I re, I, I re... <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, right now, I could say music because I had a beautiful steak for dinner. <laughs> but uh, in two hours, maybe I would go with food. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine uh, Italy without either. There's a there's a song in every Italian. It's just a beautiful thing. And there's also a, an appreciation of good food. And, and in Italy, the good food is part of that conviviality, that togetherness, that social fabric. The music and food and the piazza, it all weaves together in a way that just it enriches your life. Yeah. Hey, David Torty, you are a delight just to talk with this. We've given I, we've given uh, 20 uh, events like this in a row, and this is the one that we went over more longer than any other one. So we went long tonight. Right. And it's all your fault, my friend. You're so interesting. We've uh, no, uh, thank you. It's a blessing to have you as on, as, a, as a friend and, and a colleague. Uh, ben and, and all, all behind the scenes, all of our Monday Night Travel crew, thank you. I want to thank everybody for joining us and celebrating Europe together with us. We're thankful we found our niche and we're thankful if we can be part of your travel plans going forward. And remember, tomorrow night right here, the party is happening. Six o'clock Seattle time, nine o'clock East Coast. This room is going to be filled with our staff and it's going to be one beautiful piazza. All right. Ciao, David. Grazie. Ciao, Buon grazie. Ciao a tutti. Buonanotte, David. Buonanotte, Rick. Thank you so much. 
Ciao, good Ben. Luck. Good night, Ben. Good night, Rick. Good night, David. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Buonanotte, David. Buonanotte, Ben. Buonanotte, Buonanotte a tutti. Ciao, Heidi, Steven, and Julianne. Ciao.